Martin. That's looking positive. Um, you may not be aware, but they are live streaming uh, all of the demonstrations, because quite a few people have asked me this. They're live streaming all the demonstrations on Facebook, um, which means that they are still on Facebook. So if there's anything that you missed yesterday and you want to go back and see it, it's live streamed on Facebook. Just go into the live event and hit the recording so it's all there. So. No, they're not live streaming them, unfortunately. I think it's a lot of money just to do this one. I'm not sure. I'll check. I don't, yeah, they haven't in the past. Um, but post COVID, pretty much everything gets recorded now. Do you think? We're good. We're good to go. Ha <laughs> ha. Look at that. Nine minutes, and they said 10. Fantastic. So, we're good to go. So, I will just start by asking. Um, our two fantastic, lovely human beings here, Zoe and Halima, <laughs> what they're going to do in this session today. So, Zoe, over to you first. Okay. I am going to do some slip casting today. So I'm going to cast with some porcelain into some moulds. Um, I'm then going to show a little bit of how I might build those pieces together, and then I'm going to show a little bit about how I finish my surfaces. Halima, what, what's on your mind today? Hello, hi. Um, it's wonderful to be here again, and um, I'll be slowly carving away, paring away into the underneath of the piece, which I was carving on the reverse yesterday. Um, and I'll show some of the designs and the project I'm doing, Virtues of Unity, and talking about that as well. I apologize for the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and did both of you give your talks yesterday? Yes. Yes, we did. How many people attended the talks, just to have a good idea? How many? Oh, you can't use the same jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully you're talking to a very well-informed audience now. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just I'm, I'm sieving the slip. I always sieve it before I pour it just to make sure there's no bits in it. What's the slip, Zoe? So I, I cast with Parian porcelain. It's a really lovely slip. It's just gorgeous, to be honest. And, and what are the physical characteristics of that as opposed to ordinary porcelain? Well, I used to, I mean, it's very white. It's got a lovely color. It's really quite translucent. And um, it's also kind of slightly self-glazing. So because I don't glaze my work, it, um, it has a lovely kind of almost marble-like finish to it, which I used to use glacier porcelain, which is also really white, but it's much higher firing. And actually, it kind of retains a porosity really, really high. Um, so I, I do prefer Parian now. What does it fire to? Parian. I fire it to about 1240. So slightly lower. Yeah. Depends on the piece, to be honest. I will fire the pieces to different temperatures. Um, so, for instance, if I'm making like a big, the big casserole dish that I made in, for one of the pieces, it had a really low flat lid. And, um, it, which is the lid that I'm about to pour now. And it was really, it was a real challenge to fire because the lid would just slightly slump every time. And in the end, well, I had, there's a lot of different things that I did in the end, but one of them was I, I fired it just slightly low. I fired it to the lowest temperature that Parian could go, really. Right. If, if Zoe's using porcelain, we've got a completely contrasting set of clays here from Halima. Would you like to talk a little bit about your, your clays and the choices that you're making and your project maybe? Uh, well, uh, normally with my normal work, I have a few favorite clays that I like to use, but the particular pro project I'm doing with Virtues of Unity, I'm using clays from all around the world. 
and each clay is almost like a test piece as well because I don't know what the clay is going to actually do in the kiln. Um, so the clay I'm using at the moment is a clay from Bosnia. It seems to have a lot of uh, groggy bits and iron bits in it. And this particular clay is from Ghana. And this is round the corner in Borf. And each one has a completely different feel. And depending on how the clay feel, uh, feels um, is how I respond to it with how deep and uh, how refined I work on it as a final piece. I'm not going on my phone, by the way, guys. I'm checking Instagram. I'm just putting a timer on. I've got a time to text, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, a, I have to use timers um, for this, so I'm going to set a timer now. Just going to pour. So I'm going to pour. The, this mold here that I'm pouring now is the knob for the lid of a casserole dish. And... I'm going to set a timer for four minutes because I'll cast the knob of the lid for a lot shorter time than I will the lid because it's actually quite big and if it's too heavy, then it get, you know, when it's, in, when it's firing up to a higher temperature, it will, it's just much more likely to make the lid sink, which I really don't want. And then the other thing I just can say, I'm cut, and this mold here is, I'm casting a handle. Um, and it's, I put a pouring hole into both parts of the handle, but I'll only pour into one side. If you pour into both sides, you've got a chance of um, catching air somewhere in the middle. Whereas if you pour into one side, the slip will kind of find its way through. And I, once I know it's come all the way up, past where the handle is, I can, I can top it up. But... Ask a question. Yeah. The knob will end up hollow and the handle will end up solid, yeah. So I'll keep topping up the handle, but the, the knob, I, will, I, want it, I want it to be quite thin, really. So I'm just going to wait for two minutes and then say that again. Oh, I'll, repeat the, I'll, repeat. So, I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear it. Sorry. Uh, uh, what's the longest casting time that you do? It really, do you know, it really depends. Um, the, the bigger pieces I do tend to cast for longer just because that just um, actually, if they're big pieces, I'm not really looking for a really translucent porcelain. I just want it to be very, very white and smooth, um, particularly with the bigger pieces. So it doesn't matter to me if it's actually a little bit thicker and it's much more stable that way. So I will cast them for longer. But the thing, and I tend to cast with quite thin porcelain slips, so I will. I will sometimes, if it, come, if it arrives, I buy it as slip, it's already mixed, and if it arrives and it's a little bit too thick, I will add a little bit of water. Not loads, because obviously you then you mix up the, with the sodium silicate, you've mixed up the whole mix, messed it up, but I'll add a little bit. Just, I'd rather p cast it for longer with a thinner slip, because then I'm less likely to get any drips. I mean, kind of drip marks. So I've set the timer for the knob for four minutes, and then I'll reset it, and I'm probably going to cast that for 15 minutes and this for 12 minutes. And but I must it would really depend. So if I'd just poured this yesterday, the mold would be a bit damper, so I'd cast it for longer. Or if it's a really wet, damp, cold day in my studio, I cast it for longer again. So it's just about to go off. I've got to say, I was surprised at the thinness of your slip for casting. Oh, were you? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it is it's quite... It's more like thick milk than Yeah, no, you cream. said it didn't look like slip. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, also, of course, I cast the spoons, which I'm, I haven't got here today, but that then I really make it very thin when I'm casting a spoon because it's a really thin handle, and, it, you know, you really need it to kind of... You don't want it to clog the mould and dry before it's really filled the mould. I'm happy to while I, I yeah, 
while I wait for my time. This one's about to go, and then I'll... Then we'll I'll come back to that. We'll come back to how Zoe suspends her spoons, because I know it's what everybody wants to know. <laughs> it's like, sod the slip casting. <laughs> we all want to know. Would you like to say a little bit about your shaping and forming process? Yeah, um, the initial design is... Um, from a flat design that I've, uh, I've kind of created in the um, in my design books. Uh, the design I always work from a design book. I've, since I was at college, I've never got out of it. Um, so from a flat design, the piece is then mapped. Uh, the the design is then mapped around the convex and the concave of the form. And then once you map your design. Uh, the basic design, all the angles and depths are done um, with eye and feel. So you're constantly looking and feeling as you're carving. And with these particular pieces, as the work developed, um, I carve on both surfaces of the forms. So what's happening on the inside is always considered on the outside. So you're constantly feeling and turning it around and working out where all the weak points are so if you're carving in one direction in one side you've got to make sure what's happening in the inside is on the up uh, carved in the opposite direction so the piece constructively is quite sound and it's not going to crack on too many weak points um uh, the process is very slow um but very meditative as, as, at the same time. So normally I'd have lots of music on or, you know, I'd be talking on the phone on an intercom with one of my friends or, um, or so, uh, but it's, it's a process that you kind of submerge yourself into and you lose track of all sense of time, which is kind of a common thing for me. Could we have another look inside? Because you did yeah. this yesterday and just uh, discuss the... Yes, yeah, so that, that's inside. So the piece weighs quite heavy. Uh, there's lots more to carve out. So all these angles will go a lot more, a lot more deeper. Um, and here, there's a lot of weight here. So th these are just, um, I'm not sure what you can see, um, but here there's a lot of weight and a lot of depth what needs to put, be put in there. So for me, at this moment in time, this piece looks quite flat. So there's a lot more depth and angles that will be introduced to this piece um, and um, to give it a more kind of sculptural feeling. Um, this clay is quite beautiful to carve with actually because it's quite plastic. And even though it's got lots of stones in it, um, but the, the Garner clay um, hasn't got that say working with it when I was actually uh, physically hitting the clay into the former and building it up with the thickness that I wanted um, it didn't feel as nice whilst I was handling it and same with the both clay but this clay just seems to have that bit more plastic so I'm going to elaborate and get as many depths and angles with this clay but again you can spend all the hours that you spend on the piece like this but until it's in the kiln, you don't really know what's going to happen. So it, sorry. it looks like there's an awful lot of work gone into marking the pieces out before you ever start to curve. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I, I, there's four stages that I go through, and each one's used as a, a different process. And um, designing, I thoroughly enjoy. I spend it a lot, a lot of time designing into. Um, so I, I call them visual diaries. So I have. Uh, dozens and dozens of books of um, yeah, dozens of books that I've created over the years, which I do look back at and I do kind of refer to. But this particular book is for virtues of unity, and I collect as much information and stories and uh, what firing temperatures I actually do the clay. Some of the clay I get is really refined, like the clay from Korea, and some clays are just literally dug out of the ground from someone's back garden in that particular country. So my aim is to use them as pure and as, as I'm giving them. But with this clay, it cracked and I've rebuilt it and I've added grog and a bit of uh, ball clay just to give it a bit more plastic to stop it from cracking. Um, 
but with the design, so once I've got all my designs, I then make the form. The form's really important where you need to concentrate because when you're working with this thickness or when they're almost uh, much thicker than this, you don't want to get any air bubbles in. So if you get any air bubbles in that kind of thickness, you, you know, it will explode and, and cause it to crack. So once you've got your design, which is mapped on as precisely as possible with the chosen design, you then start doing the enjoyable bit, which is the carving. Um, and the carving is a stage where you can completely submerge yourself, but the, the design, I don't know, for me, I loved the design and then taking it to another dimension by mapping it onto a convex and concave surface gives it a new dimension compared to the drawing. So this drawing, sorry, I'll just open this one up. So that drawing is this one and the, um, the Bosnian clay is this one. So it takes it into a new dimension. And then when you carve into it, it takes it into a third dimension with the depths and angles. And again, once you've carved these angles, you then start manipulating those planes of those designs and curving them under and cutting them underneath one another. Uh, and these create kind of dra dramatic shadows and a lot of drama within the individual pieces. Thank you. I think it's really interesting that the work on stage couldn't actually look more diverse, but in essence, they're just two carvers, just in very different ways. Yeah, I was, I was just listening actually to Halima, I was talking and I, I do, you know, so the stuff I'm showing is one part of the process, but the carving part is another part of the process. And I, I do the same, I, you know, it's quite a meditative process. And, so can I ask you about that, Zoe, in terms of if people aren't familiar with your practice, if we look at this extraordinary saucepan here, you know, you have carved the handle, the knob, you have carved it all out of solid blocks of plaster. I'm going to ask you why, you perverse thing, that you don't go and just cast a saucepan. I know the hours you spend carving. So why the carving and you know when I, I don't know if I said why wouldn't I make a mold of a saucepan why don't you make a mold of the beautiful Tupperware jug you know the 1960s Tupperware jug and yet you carve it out for days on end why well I mean the number of there's some pr practical reasons because I cast in in, in porcelain um, if I was to cast that saucepan whole I'd have to do a few different parts because the handles attached to the body um, so it would be a two or three or more part mould. Um, and when you, have, um, when you do that, the clay molecules, they kind of go up, they follow into the, the crack of the, the, the two different parts of the mould. And even if you then shave that off and spend a lot of time sanding that away at a later point, oh, <laughs> um, when it goes back in the kiln, because it's porcelain and it has a really strong memory of what's happened, um, that, that, that line will come back again. So that's one practical reason, because um, the pieces I'm making, I really want... I'm going to have to just concentrate just for yeah, a second. Yeah, you, you do what you need to do. We'll come back to that. I have to... What's kind of important when you're tipping out is you tip in one go, um, just to get a nice, clean kind of pour out. So you have to get yourself into position and then go. Because it's quite thin, Zoe, I presume drips, internal drips, are less of a problem than if it's much less of a problem. Viscosity. Yeah, that's why I do it. Really, I'd rather cast it for longer, um, and then I've got less kind of worry about the kind of those drip run marks. Um, there's nothing worse than when you're going for translucency and then there's a big drip. The I end. think, <laughs> I was just thinking, going back to your question, I mean, the other part of it is there's, um, there's something about, uh, for me, the taking the time and paying attention to, the, you know, the time that it takes to carve all of these different pieces of the object. Um, for me, they're, they're kind of, I'm wanting them to be objects of contemplation, really, more that they're obviously, they, I want them to be very, very familiar, but also somehow not familiar. 
um, so that you know what it is, but at the same time, you're slightly kind of like, you know, you, you're seeing it again for the first time, hopefully. And, um, and, and I suppose the, the length of time is something of a reverie, I suppose, for something which is very ordinary and prosaic, really. That, that's another reason. But that sense of labour, sorry, it's the same with Halima in a sense. It gives a value, doesn't it? I think it Just does. I feel it does give a value, yeah. Halima, would you talk a little bit about the philosophy behind the complicated patterns that you do? Yeah, um, I mean, I've always, from being a child, been really inspired by... Uh, plant formations and, you know, pulling petals apart, the, you know, deconstructing plants and looking at the uh, symmetry and the ge geometry that you find with those. Um, and I think as a child and growing up throughout my education, the two subjects I've really loved is maths and art. And I think, you know, growing up in Manchester and Liverpool, I think that beautiful kind of hand-carved, moulded buildings that you have around those areas and the richness of those architectural buildings have always been a big influence as well in that kind of formation of my thinking of pattern. And with Virtues of Unity, um, for me, what's lovely is, as an installation, you know, the patterns that you see within there, which people kind of seem to connect in them in different ways, you know, both children or, you know, uh, non-people. Um, you know, uh, I think pattern is a very universal language understood by um, everyone, and it's like walking in nature and the, all the, the foliage and all the patterns you find, you know, with the ripples of the water or the sand dunes, patterns around us. So it's kind of... For me, it's a kind of connection that you have with your surroundings and um, with the pieces, I tend not to repeat a design. Um, I think I've only ever done it once in my career because when you go for this whole process of carving a piece, once you've actually revealed it, then you want to move on to your next design or your next kind of uh, sketch in the book to see uh, whether it works out as well as you see it in your head. Do you look a, a quite a bit at nature as well as uh, man-made carvings? And, and they look so floral. And, uh, I, um, I think when I'm designing, I kind of just sketch whatever's in my head. But when I'm walking or when I'm around outside, I'm always absorbing all the beautiful things. I'm always looking. I've, I don't... I'm terrible because I'm always like saying to the children, "Look at this, oh, look at that," you know. And I think they think I'm a bit crazy just looking at every, you know, just the, the icicles as you're walking in winter on plants and the crystallisation and um, uh, you know patterns found all around us. So I think I'm always absorbing and taking in these beautiful designs um, that surround us. And I suppose for some people they might not notice them, but for me. They're there and they're constantly feeding my thoughts and my, and my imagination. I'll just repeat that question. So you talk about how you use a different design for each country. How much does the vegetation and the different aspects of that country influence the design? Um, I, I, each, the names, I, I name all my pieces. Um, the names come as I'm designing them or after I've carved them. So I wouldn't necessarily say a design is influenced by a country um, normally. Um, um, so, uh, you know, I mean, when I, did, when I was carving the Costa Rica uh, clay, I know the person who got me the clay was showing me lots of the painting, the folk painting that um, is very famous in Costa Rica. So I did look at that um, as a source of inspiration 
for the design, but um, they use a lot of angles. And with this installation, it's all about curves and that kind of femininity with those curves and um, natural forms. Um, so yeah, th th I would say the design and the naming comes um, um, after um, after the uh, process of uh, of that. So. I mean, the names of this particular installation, Virtues of Unity, sometimes the country does influence the name, but um, other times it might be the person who got me the clay and their personality, or if I know them, or, or the situation. Um, so the clay from Cuba was from someone I kind of knew uh, called Hillary, and um, she went to... <clears throat> She went to Cuba on a ballet dan on a dancing course and got me some clay from a farmer uh, who dug the clay out from his guard, back of his garden. And when she brought it back, um, she carried it on her hips. So when she offered me the bag of clay, it was in a U shape, which was then, um, you know, it was wonderful. I took a picture of it and, um, and she carried it through customs. But that particular clay I called hilarity, so it was more to do with her. So the naming um, and the design is done with my response with the clay. So. Can I just remind about the oh, <laughs> We've had a gentle reminder about the spoon. Yes. Um, which bit? Do, which? Oh no no no. So. Um, I now I tell you, if she tells you that recipe, she'll have to kill you. <laughs> because I was her tutor when no. she tested that recipe. No, no, no. I, uh, and I can tell you, it was used I, to practice. I, so I only use porcelain. So I, I fire the, por the spoons twice first. So they're high fired. And, um, oh, I will come back to it, I promise. <laughs> promise. I haven't set these on purpose. If you, have, if you, if you saw Zoe's... Uh, workspace when she was a student with us in Cardiff, uh, it was, she, um, oh my God, I mean, thousands of flux tests, literally, of glazes dripping, 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 dripping. So it was a, a long, a very, very long and... Um, it is a lot of testing. A lot of testing. It's been a lot, a lot of testing. I do have quite a lot of fails, probably about 50% don't, don't work. Um, but basically, so I fire the spoons first, I, I add a flux to the porcelain um, that I'm using. So I use the same porcelain, but I add a flux to it. Um, and so the spoons have already been fired. Then I prop them into the position I want them to be um, using kiln fiber. And I get them into the position that I want. Um, and then the flux um, is mixed with the porcelain, so when it, when it goes into the kiln, it looks like a clay, so it just looks like a spoon with a lump of clay on it. And then I'll obviously test it a lot of different temperatures, and I'll fire it to a certain temperature, and at a certain temperature, because it's got the flux in, it's got a lower melting point, and it will begin to melt, and the spoon won't. And so that will begin to melt, and then I will soak it to a certain for a certain amount, and, it, and I'll hopefully catch a really good drip. The trick, what I'm, I'm hoping for is, you know, something that's thick enough to hold the spoon up, you know, so it's got to be strong enough and thick enough to hold the spoon up. And then, obviously, when it cools, it's hard, and I can take all the props away, and then it's, it's there it is. So it is an authentic drip. It's... What, what's the um, resist at the bottom? The material must flow down onto. Do you put a ceramic fiber? I just no. I just use backwash. All right, just backwash. Yeah, and then I I grind off the backwash afterwards. And in terms of failures, I mean, you talk about a 50% failure rate with the drips, but you did cast that colander. How many times? And fired how many times before you got one? I did it 11 out? times before you got one Yeah, out. because I think the thing is, although, you know, so I'm just kind of, you know, I, I have a certain understanding now of slip casting and mold making, 
each object's really different. And, um, and I tend to, you know, I'll move from one object to another. So the colander, um, yeah, I just, yeah, that's kind of the crazy thing about porcelain. So, I, you know, I mean, some of them did break in the making of them, but many of them went into the kiln looking absolutely pristine. And then they'd come out and there'd be some kind of dent or kind of movement in them and which you know depending on how you're using porcelain isn't it if you want it to be free flowing and do its thing it's fantastic but if you really want a kind of a perfect rim around a colander and it's not then it's really obvious and no good um, so I use um, setters which actually I got from one of the factories in Stoke um, so I, I'll fire the colander upside down on a setter and, but because it has that um, this, that particular colander, it has a foot on it as well. I, I ended up having to make a setter for the foot as well. Um, so it was on a, on a setter and had a setter on the top. And finally, I, I got it. But I had the same situation with the casserole because of the lid. And what I would probably have done again, if you've got a, low, a big, low, flat lid, what you generally would do is you um, in your when you make the mold you'd compensate for it so you'd make a actually a, a bigger round than you want with the knowledge that as it when it goes into the kiln it's going to sink a little bit so you kind of you make up for the. So when you say setter, you mean it's yeah, so it's a round, um, very high fired, um, very kind of grog stable clay that they use in industry. And they're, they're kind of on a coat, they kind of have that kind of shape. So as the piece shrinks, it can just move up the cone, but it keeps its, it, what it does is it keeps its circularity. So it stops it kind of moving around, which obviously it does more. If you, as soon as you add handles onto something, they kind of want to pull it in a certain direction. Uh, we have a question just behind. Setter. A setter. A kiln prop. Props it up in the kiln. Fiber, ceramic fiber. Okay. Yeah. Ceramic. On ceramic fiber, yeah. Props it up with ceramic fiber because you can cut the fiber to kind of any shape to prop the spoon. You have to be, it's, it's not very nice stuff. <laughs> you don't want to be using a lot of it. No, and you want to be wearing gloves and probably a mask because, it, you know, it's got glass in it. So it, it, um, and the other thing I do use as well, um, sometimes for my spoons or for some of the handles, um, as well as setters because of their, their different shapes, is alumina hydrate. So I can make a bed with alumina hydrate. And um, that, again, though, is really horrid stuff and has, you have to wear a mask. Uh, we have a question here. In the, yep, in the pattern shirt. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, sorry. D did you have your hand up? No? Yeah, yes. What, have you noticed any difference in the results you get firing at 12.40 as opposed to 12.20? Say that again, sorry. Do you notice any characteristic differences firing at 12.40 to 12.20? Slightly less translucency. It's, it's, it's bottom temperature for parry and it is 12.20. So, you know, it, it, is, it is fired and it is porcelain at that stage. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's slightly less translucent. And you can go higher than 1240 as well, and it will get even more translucent. You're increasing your risk then, though, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Do you use soak? I have so many different firings for so many different objects. Um, I sometimes use soaks. I tend to use soaks more for the spoons when they're dripping. Um, so I have a little soak at the top temperature. And another question just here? Yeah. Yeah, the lifespan, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so because you're using a, a thinner slip, the more you use moisture, the shorter the lifespan of the mold. Yeah, in a sense. probably. Does it, does it affect it? But the, I suppose the thing is, I'm, because I'm not really a production maker, it's kind of a mad process, isn't it, really? 
I can see that. <laughs> It's a very lengthy process for some one-off objects, really. But um, the reason is, there's not, you know, that's how I can get like a really lovely, thin, smooth, thin-walled porcelain object using this process. That's how I can do it. Um, if I was production, yeah, absolutely, because I'd be using it a lot more. But I'm not using the moulds in, in that way, I suppose. And, I, you know, they do wear out. I have to make them again. Right. Oh, and another question in the blue, yep. Oh, sorry, I said the one behind you was just about in the, yep. Are you going to explain how you have to fasten that handle on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was do. telling you to wait, they'd be greedy for that now. How do you put the handle on? <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't, if, if you came yesterday, um, I was just showing how I made the model of the handle to fit, fit the mold, fit the body. Um, and that's really important. Um, and really, very simply, I don't score it. I just, but I, what I do do is I, and it's really d down to the, um, as with anything, if you're joining clay, basically, they need to be the same dampness. Um, but what I will do is just use slip, but um, I'll, I'll just damp it with water first, because if you don't do that, if you, if you don't damp it with water first, you add some slip to the, to the body, it'll suddenly it'll dry really quickly. You'll get a lump, and then you, your handle won't fit on nicely. So I, I wet both it, both pieces first, add some slip, put it on. And we had a question here. Yeah. I don't, oh, yes. So no, they, I don't. No, I don't. I don't. Just so you're aware, the question was, uh, with the spoons and the firing, do you have to control the way the temperature drops, as, as you would with crystal forming and things, yeah? Well, while we're talking about firings, would you go through your drying and firing process? Because um, it was quite extraordinary when, when I heard you give a schedule. And, uh, and, your, and your, your problems with failures or successes or tests. Yeah, I mean, in general, um, if I know the clay, then obviously I know how much risk taking I can take. But with, uh, with clays that I've not worked with, with, with this particular installation, I try and leave them as long as possible. And, but as you're working with a cl clay or handling the clay in the soft and carving, you tend to get a feel for it. So you know how much you can actually push it. And so. In general, as you're carving, the pieces drying more and more, and by the time I get to my uh, desired angles and depths, the clay would have dried out somewhat completely, but would have had uh, would still have moist in the deeper and the thickest part of the f uh, forms. And for that reason, you leave it for as long as you can. And depending on the size, um, you know, you can leave it for two weeks to dry, or if you're working on a much larger piece, you can leave it to a month to two months to dry very slowly in kind of controlled conditions. So uh, last year I was working on a very large piece. I, I left it for several months before um, I uh, fired it, but just because there was 92 kilos of clay and uh, <clears throat> the form itself was very thick on certain elements. So when I'm carving, <clears throat> the thickness varies from a millimeter to maybe seven inches thick, um, or could be completely solid form. So you kind of can't really take any risks of it drying too fast, both when you're carving it as well as when the final piece is finished. Um, and again, with the firing, I take that up super slow, and I try and pack the kiln as, as much as I can. And if I don't have enough to pack it with, I always put a lot of props in. Because I think the cooling process, as it's in the kiln, is as important as it going up. Um, and yeah, so it's a very slow process. I, I remember you said something like 20, 20, 20 degrees an hour? Y yeah, tw well, 10 degrees an hour to yeah. the first, first 100. Depend on these one, I would probably take about 10 degrees just because um, there's a lot of impurities in the clay. So I, you're taking a lot of risk for so those kind of impurities and just also to make sure it's dry as well. So if you've got such a big form and you've spent months carving it, you don't want to take any risk in it uh, blowing up or cracking or, you know, if they've 
I mean, some of the clays, like some of the crank clays you use, which I use in my normal work, you know they're very forgiving, but some of these clays are not forgiving at all. And plus, you're not experiment. I don't tend to do that many test firings with them unless it's a complete clay that I've got no information about regarding the firing temperatures. But normally, when you work with the clay, you have a good feeling and a sense about it. But you vary the firing temperature based on what you think the clay yeah. will take. Yeah. To make it as strong as possible, but. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, normally a lot of clays, um, you tend to get a lot of information or what the local people fire it at and, uh, you know, what, what, what's the limitations. But um, with these two particular clays, they've just literally been dug up on someone's journey in Bosnia and someone's journey in um, and Ghana. So it's a very raw kind of state of clay. And, and do you sometimes modify things to to, yeah, to suit it's, what you know what you need to do with it? Yeah, I mean this particular clay from uh, Bosnia, I've not added anything into, and I've used it as raw as possible as the lumps they came in. But with the Ghana clay, um, um, just feeling it, it didn't feel strong, and then I did try and uh, work with it, but it was cracking. So this has been dried and sieved and. I've added grog into it, and then that didn't work, and I've added uh, ball clay into it, and I'm still not confident with it. And uh, you know, and I was hoping for the ICF, you know, to do be able to do a piece in the ball clay that I was kindly given a few months ago. Um, and again, that had the same, if not worse, than the Ghana clay. You know, um, I have not, as a flat piece, it's structurally staying together, but as soon as you put any tension on the form, by like making a, um, a form out of it of some sort, then you find cracking before you even put the design on. Is, is there a, a reason that you more or less avoided glaze or color, except with the clay itself? Although oh, the glazing? One, there is a you mean glazing? I, I'm just asking if there, have you, do, you, do you ever think of putting glazes on them. I noticed there's a big dish in your exhibition. Yeah, that was Quite a very dramatic. early piece. That was uh, my blue stage. I mean, I did go through a stage of using glazes, and particularly blue glazes, because of my love for Moroccan architecture. And, um, um, and what I found was when I was um, carving intricate uh, or very sharp angles, by putting a glaze on, you tend to do um, round the edges by spraying or dipping the, uh, the piece into a, a glaze and for me it's all about the shadow and the drama and the um, drama you know the drama the sharp angles create so if you soften those angles it softens that drama of shadow and play of light so so you prefer the strength of light and dark rather yep. than modifying it okay yep. So That's yeah, yeah, no, it's a lot more softer, and you, you know, um, if you look at the pieces what have been glazed, you can see the carvings, and but the shadows uh, are not as dramatic as, let's say, the black piece next to it, which has got no glaze on it, and the angles, and even though that's a black clay, the the shadows and the play of light is a lot more dramatic on that piece than it is on the blue piece, which has been glazed. All oh, right, it's a whole it's a whole other territory then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we have a few minutes left just for a couple of questions. Yes, the lady in black. Okay, yeah. So Halima, the question is that even uh, knowing that you work on one piece at a time, does it ever come to the point where you have to, working on it for a length of time, spray it with water to keep it workable? No, <clears throat> I, try, I try not to spray it. I try and I tend normally just to work on one piece at a time, and as I'm working on it, um, I work on it constantly. And something this size might take me a uh, week and a half, two weeks uh, or so to carve and get to the. So th what I'm doing now is rough carving it. So I'm taking out the initial shapes and patterns, I'm working out my angles, and then once I work those out, I start going deeper into the form. And then as I get deeper, I'm, then once I've got all my depths and my angles and my curves, then I start refining those shapes and those planes of the, um, uh, the design. And each time you take those different stages, each time 
the structure of the piece is dry and dry, and that's what keeps all the sharp angles, is working on it on a state which is harder each time. So I start off carving when it's past leather dry, in between leather dry and completely dry, but when I come to finish this piece to the surfaces that I want, it will be almost completely dry. Not completely dry, but almost. And on the basic feel of it, it'll feel dry, but there will be still moist in the deeper parts. So no, I don't spray it. I try not to spray it because it can soften the edges. And when you put your bag, when you cover the piece, um, every time you do finish working on it, that will soften the edges and round the edges off, which I don't want. <laughs> yep. Up right. behind, sorry. Uh, Zoe, how did you get the holes in your calendar? <laughs> so, I don't know if you watched yesterday. Yeah. Um, do you remember when I was marking off the center line using the compass, and I was doing it from one side, and I was getting a line all the way down? Um, so, I, that's how I, I did it. I, I marked them off um, on the model um, using, using that technique, and then just put a little tiny mark um, where each hole was going to be, so that when I cast it, that mark was, was came out on the cast. And so then I just used a kind of one of those, a hole maker. One of the blue pencils just to leave it yeah. so it picked up on the cast. Um, no, I, I literally just kind of scraped oh, slightly into indentation. the model. Okay. Yeah. So um, the tiny indentation. Tiny on indentation the on the model, and then so that that comes out on the cast. Um, and then, yeah, just the hole maker, the hole maker. Quite satisfying. How many holes are there on a calendar? <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't go that, I haven't gone that far. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> I haven't counted right, them. I think we're, we're pretty much out of time. I did want to just um, draw attention to the shrinkage rate of our oh. cups, so people get an idea of what yeah. that looks like in terms of, and is but, that, that's not the same. That, Cup. No, it's not quite the same. It's not quite the same. But yeah, um, the model will be even slightly bigger than that because it obviously shrinks to bisque. And then I'm just finishing it now. I mean, and this is a point which does take quite a long time. And I, I, I just, so I don't really do any finishing, hardly any finishing at that stage. I'll put, it, put the piece together and then I'll just fire it to, to quite a low bisque firing um, and then I do all the fish finishing at bisque firing and I think the reason I do that is just to avoid any kind of movement I don't I don't want any kind of movement to happen at that stage and once it's at this stage I know there's not going to be any movement so I'll, in terms of the the, ri the lip here I'll, I'll sand it down to to however thin I want it to be and I sand probably from 1240 to 320 to 400 about that but, so it's a long, that's, that's when I start listening to books. <laughs> and, and would you like to say a final comment about how you will finish these particular pieces off? Or just yeah, um, my, my normal work, I tend to refine and burnish all the edges and, you know, so you spend as much time carving uh, and shaping as you, uh, and then I would spend almost equal amount of time actually burnishing all the edges and all the deep parts and, often, and sometimes some of the parts, elements of the overall design, um, which takes it ta its time. But with this particular installation, Virtues of Unity, everything is just um, fettled to a, um, a soft finish and all the corners are fettled to a soft finish. Um, that's so that the colours stay soft, because once you start burnishing them, you can... Um, when you fire them high, it can vitrify the edges and make them a lot more shinier. And with the installation, because I want one piece to work next to the piece it sat next to, having that soft finish helps it kind of blend in better. I think um, we've got two talented people who have got extraordinary patience, <laughs> concentration, endurance, yeah. and the result is extraordinary finishes and extraordinary pieces. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I'm uh, mindful that we've overrun with this session, so we have a very quick turnaround to prepare for Keith's talk. So if I could uh, ask you to respect not coming onto the stage, that would be great, so we can do a quick turnaround.